both, I love that the Fox News headline you mentioned, and we mean it this time, because that sort of self-acknowledgement that is also sort of a threat seems to be this sort of, there's an awareness that like, and because sometimes it's, it's spoken in marketing terms, sometimes it's spoken in demographic terms, sometimes it's spoken in electoral terms, but this sort of insistence on lat that Latinos matter because they're new is an insidious way of forcing, a, ritualizing the amnesia around Latino enduring presence. I would say, um, to answer the question about the theatrical roots, right, where have we come, this has been something we see all the time, and especially when we looked at, you know, the, the groundbreaking work of El Teatro Campesino, all of, you know, trying to chart it back to European roots, which, yes, there was influence, right, but that, that the work there was influenced by the Mexican carpa, and, and that there are roots in our, our root cultures that are theatrical, right, that we don't come from a purely European theatrical tradition, um, and I think that's part of the dynamic as well as that ignoring this cultural amnesia to ignore our own performance traditions uh, in terms of music, performance, dance, you know, all of these theatrical roots. Um, so I think that's another issue as well. And then the only thing I want to say about the Time article is like, we mean it too. <laughs> we mean it too. And I think it's an incredibly important question for us to absorb and be conscious of and push back against because I know in our theater communities, 20 years ago, the conversation when you would meet with large mainstream lort theaters would be like, when are you going to produce us? When are you going to produce us? And now when you look around the country, you look at the Latino Theater Commons, HowlRound, the um, National Latino Theater Alliance, and the regional alliances that are focusing, we've stopped, we're pushing back on that question, and we're not dwelling on when are you going to produce us, because we now have a vibrant had a long-standing tradition, it just hasn't always been acknowledged within the mainstream media. So I think it's a really important um, quote for us to uh, absorb and have at the forefront, but also to have us acknowledge what is happening in our communities with uh, the, the work taking place that we're doing here and now. Um, yeah, and I think that it's really important, I think, as arts, uh, art makers and art advocates in this room to sort of when we hear this rhetoric or perhaps we're encountering an institution, whether it be an academic or a cultural institution, who's asking questions using this frame. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of saying, we're interested, like the numbers, we want to make sure we reach out, is to approach it as a wedge, not a wave, right? Don't, like, don't try to ride the wave, because the wave is going to crash and it's going to go and you're going to be left behind. But it can be the way in. Mm -hmm. It can be the way in, but I think it has to be used, we have to use the rhetoric of that very carefully. Mm -hmm. because it's not rhetoric that is designed for our enduring presence. Mm -hmm. And so, so, but if it does create a wedge for us to be able to have the conversation, to make the claim for the speaker series or to make the claim for the, for the cycle in the civic uh, event in town, then by all means use it, but to understand that it's, it's use it strategically and not, because I think, I think part of the reason I began to think about it is my hopes had been dashed before. You mm -hmm. know, I thought it was I thought it was about to change, and, and it didn't. <laughs> you know, and so so this kind of be like there's something insidious about the language that we want to use very very mindfully if we do use it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and at the same time being aware of uh, and being conscious of how we can interrupt the the, the yes. very cyclicality of you know like, like I, I think at one point uh, during our, our earlier conversation you like like you were mentioning specific headlines that you remember you know like like from from the from the 70s from the 80s like 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 almost uh, like a very precise pattern of so like how many years between them. Yeah, I mean, uh, th uh, the, there's a page in my book um, uh, that uh, is sort of, it cost me a lot of money to get this page, so I'm going use to the, use the time. Um, it, uh, well, there's four Time Magazine covers, one going from Hispanic American, soon the greatest majority, uh, in 1987. Magnifico, Latino culture breaking out of the barrio. Uh, 1999, Ricky Martin, pop. Latin music goes, you know, and it's, and then um, 2012, uh, uh, Latino, Latinos will decide the next president. You know, it's always in this anticipatory thing, and it's always soon, about to, they're about to be really important. And all of those coincide with anxieties about, like, the amnesty moment in the, in the mid-80s, or the first concern that 2000 census was going to do the demographic shift. 2012, right after that demographic confirmation. You know, these kind of moments of managing this uncertainty of the, what is the terrain. Mm -hmm. um, and the language is the same, 
And it, that's why I sort of see it as its own kind of popular performance itself, where it's, um, you know, it's like it happens. And it's like, OK, we're going to do it. And then what's great uh -huh. is initiatives get established, careers get made. I, I, can't, I mean, if you go through the long, long arc of, of mainstream icons, you know, in, of Latino, like, they probably notched that awareness in the previous life. Right? And so there are opportunities. But, um, but it's, it's, I think the cycle is definitely, you know, it'll happen again. So, yeah. so, you know, and the question is, what do we as right now, what do we right now have as a, um, uh, you know, what's going on that's different now? Because I do think there are certain things that are different now. But at the same time, I do think that there are ways in which we, uh, we are doing something that is different now, that it's not driven by journalistic boilerplate. It's not driven by reactionary discourse. Mm -hmm. And so I think to be attentive to what we are doing as the Latino, th this kind of gathering is important as well. Yeah, I just want to add in terms of, because Brian talked about every 10 years we see this happening, we also need to look at our own plays, our own works of art that address this, right? At Time Magazine, Time Magazine, right? The decade mm -hmm. of the Hispanic and then the year of the Latino. And, but uh, I think about like La Victima from El Teatro uh, de la Esperanza, who was looking at every 10 years or so when there is a major economic crisis, then uh, immigrants and particularly Mexican Americans are deported or scapegoated against, right? And that this was a cycle. And that's a play from the 70s that was already talking about that cycle from the 1930s. And we still see that cycle happening. It's just shorter and shorter. We yeah. don't have the luxury of 10 years. It's like every year, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, so, so far, uh, like, like, you know, we, we've been using, uh, we've been using terms like Latinos, we've been using terms like, you know, Hispanic, and, 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 and even there, like, you know, within the community, there, there is pushback about, like, like, the use of, of terms like that. So when we engage in a conversation about Latino theater, it seems like we should take a moment to parse out what the heck we mean by Latino theater, right? And I think for all of, you know, for all of us who are engaged in season selection, for, you know, various institutions, or as producing artists, or as theater makers, ourselves that that uh, thorny question of what makes a story a Latina Latino story right is it the identity of its creator the identity of its writer is it its characters or its setting its language or its dialect the narrative conventions its themes its politics um, what does Latina Latino theater look like what does it sound like what does it taste like is there an identifiable Latina Latino performance aesthetic? So when, when, when you think about Latina Latino theater, what, what comes up for you? Uh, for me, it's, it's all of those things and then some. I mean, obviously, uh, I think about serving our students and nurturing the next, next generation of Latino theater artists. And so uh, you can't be it if you can't see it. So it's crucial. That, uh, uh, that the playwright themselves identify as Latino. I think about someone like Maria Reen Fornes and uh, her, her, her Hispanic Playwrights Lab, and really she herself would push back against that term, but she also recognized that you can't feed the lifeblood of American theater and the diversity of voices if you're not nurturing Latino theater artists. So there has to be a space for the fostering of people who, who come from that cultural tradition. And I think as a play like Sweat, which we, many of us just came out of, illustrates the things that are very culturally specific, they speak to us about very universal um, themes and issues like work and labor. So I, I think nurturing Latino playwrights is part of nurturing Latino theater. It's, it's how they identify. But you know, when we look at the historical tradition, there are certain aesthetics that come out of it, going back to you know, beyond Luis Valdez uh, and El Teatro Campesino, but looking at El Teatro Campesino and the tradition of Luis Valdez and the use of the ACTO. I think about we saw uh, at the Carnival 2015 in Chicago, we saw Diane Rodriguez's Sweetheart Deal and how within that play, she's pressing very contemporary storytelling about uh, a family story but within it looking at the uh, tradition of the acto and how that feeds the performers that are in the play. So, um, you know, there are, when you look at the histories, there's histories and aesthetics, but I think the building block is the writers themselves and how they're responding to the world and the shaping of their identities. Um, I'm very, in my work, I'm really interested in how Latino theater artists write about issues of violence and trauma 
because I, I don't feel uh, uh, anyone's humanity is fully witnessed until we acknowledge their pain and their stories of trauma and violence. And there's a very um, particular aesthetics there in the way that the conversations are being staged. Um, so it, it's a combination of identity, themes, but when you look at the history, there are very distinct aesthetics that you can identify. I think the idea of what does the Latino theater look like, um, it, for me, I think that's a question where we can challenge ourselves, right? I think there's an idea of like, oh, okay, brown bodies on stage, but Latinos are, you know, brown, uh, Afro-Latino, Asian, indigenous, European, uh, and that that gives us sort of such a hybridity, um, but that's not the representation that we see. And I think within our, what Tiffany said, we've been producing, we're sort of pushing against the mainstream, and I think it's a challenge for ourselves that when we produce work, um, to make sure that we are thinking intersectionally and that we are um, finding ways to include those voices or else we replicate this model of exclusion um, and, then we, and then we only propagate sort of the same kind of look. Um, and then also I, I wonder about um, artists who are Latino who are working on plays that are not necessarily Latino, but they bring those sensibilities to the piece. So um, I'm working with director Alejandra Cisneros, who's here, who's a fabulous director, is working on a play by Madhuri Shekhar at the LATC. It's a completely diverse cast. There's a whole monologue in Spanish in it that's not translated at all. Um, and so it's beautiful, this sort of cacophony. I think of Latino theater as this cacophony that's just beautiful um, and that a lot of people don't understand. And I think that that's part of the challenge for us, but also for audiences, too, to sort of um, relinquish a little bit of control um, and that it, it's okay to be alienated or to not understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would agree, and I mean, with everything that's being said, and I think sort of when I try to sort of open up this stuff for myself or in, and my students and others I'm in conversation with, I try to sort of hold myself to the conversation about Latino theater as a tradition, not a genre. You know, this idea that Latino theater making is a complicated, complex, historically situated, culturally specific tr set of traditions, that there's all kinds of conversations, like any tradition. It's, it's, it evolves, it's, it's complex, whereas I think there's often a craving for seek sort of genre hallmarks, right? And at the same time, I like to sort of say that, like, I think Latino performance makers um, can introduce a ghost with a lot fewer problems than a lot of, uh, you know, almost any other cultural tradition, any other cultural tradition of playmaking, you gotta do a lot of work to set up the ghost. At this point, if it's a Latino world, a ghost or a spirit or a parallel reality, it's okay, we got it. And, um, and, and I do think that there are sort of, just like there is the, the gesture that I see as one of the hallmarks of the Latino theater tradition, which is the satiric, anchored in the Afro, but other, other, other iterations as well, of commenting upon the world as it sees you, and then answering back in a sort of a, a subtle shift like this. And so I think that, and I think that that is very much how Latinos inhabit the, ca the category of Latino. We say like, okay, yeah, I'm a Latino, I'm also Mexican. You know, or I'm also, <laughs> like, I, you know, like there's this way of sort of saying, yeah, yeah, Latino, okay, I'm, I'm from New, New Mexico. You know, these kinds of, the simultaneity of saying, yeah, that's how you see me, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. This sort of reciprocal naming is something that I think is also a gesture that, I mean, we saw uh, Lynn Nottage do a call out to that in the character of Oscar and Sweat today. Like the way he names, he sees how he's seen and he answers back in a way that isn't always expected, often with a tinge of humor or self-awareness. Or, or self, self like I'm, I'm telling you, I'm making a joke and I don't expect anybody else to laugh kind of humor, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and I think that there is, that, that the fact that a playwright has sort of invested in, in listening to the works of other writers, that she could tune in to that single gesture of that, you know, the, the theater tradition and use that to anchor some of the key pivotal moments in her play, I think was just really an example of how we do have a legible tradition. The problem is, is we're trying to there's an attempt to commodify as a genre, mm -hmm. and that leads to the sort of the use and often unsophisticated reliance on cliche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. So, so so it sounds like, you know, that that simultaneous awareness of, right, like knowing the legacy from which we're drawing at the same time being conscious of how not to be entrapped by it, right? Not not to be uh, not to be limited by it, right? But at the same time, does that provide opportunities for us to to play with that and have that be a platform for something else? Well, 
hearing people talk, I was thinking about how important it is to understand that, um, that the form of the storytelling, the aesthetics of the sto storytelling, form and meaning, I think in any art form, they're always intertwined. I think about Mumia Abu Jamal when you read his essays, they're like, you know, paragraphs. Well, it's because of his conditions of incarceration and he literally has a few minutes in a phone call to uh, tell his story and somebody on the end writing it. The form of the storytelling is uh, part of the meaning and related to the si system, uh, the situation of one's identity. I think about Luis Alfaro's Saint Jude and the way he's telling this story of the movement of his family history uh, down the highway, the cities of California, and how he marks it um, in, in really also signaling our health, uh, our, our psychological health, our emotional health with the, uh, the diabetes check, um, doing a pinprick, and so marking this movement of family and memory and blood on a map. The form of the story, the metaphor of the story, the aesthetics of story, it's really related to his identity, but it's also related to Latino cultural identity, the way that we're a, a people who have had um, identities mapped on us in uh, very historical ways, but we also uh, have a history of movement and migration. Um, so aesthetics inform to me in reading Latino art, in art generally, but within our own culture, they take on these very historically and culturally specific meanings that when you start thinking about the specificity of Latino culture, I think it opens up um, the way that we can read the expression of the storytelling on the stage through the artistry of metaphor and through the performer's use of body and what really brilliant directors do, um, just even in like the, the Olga staged reading today that we saw of Delano earlier, just the, the way that um, the creative artist is thinking about movement. Juliet Carrillo is here and she's another person that every time I see her staged readings, just her sense of the history of movement and uh, how bodies occupy space, it always takes the storytelling to a next level. So I, I think aesthetics and form and meaning, they're embedded in our thinking about history and culture. Yeah, and I just, one of the things as a performance studies person, I'm really interested in what performance can do, right? And so I'm really interested in how um, a lot of Latino theater is uh, meant to be um, our version of history, right? Because our versions of history are not told in the dominant, um, you know, mainstream sort of uh, books and literature and just, um, you know, information that's out there. And so I think about plays that are trying to tell our stories from our perspective and re, uh, you know, uncover this history that's been covered up. So I think about, you know, like Culture Clash's Chavez Ravine for me is a huge piece that shows us from that perspective. Um, and it also sort of reimagines uh, what Latino spaces look like and what lays beneath those grounds. Um, and so I think for, when we think about Latino theater, I, I also really love to think what can it do um, to inform others, but also ourselves of our own history, right? It's a form of history uh, documentation and also history making, right, in the present moment. Um, and so we saw a lot of that impulse at the plays in the Carnival as well. Um, and so this, it becomes a forum for us to document our own history. I'd, I'd love to stay on that thread of I mean, like talking about form, talking about the transformation of meaning and, and where theater engages with history, right? Of, of, of a community telling in its own story, right? From its, like the multiplicity of points of view. Because um, you know, th there's been much talk about um, th like this moment of adaptation that, that seems to be surfacing in, in Latina, Latino theater. Uh, the, uh, the breathless articles about Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, acclaimed musical Hamilton and about how he's using uh, different tropes, different idioms, uh, uh, uniquely Latino conventions to tell a uniquely American story, right? Uh, you know, taking that story and making it his own. Uh, or, you know, our very own resident playwright, Luis Alfaro, taking on the Greeks and, and simultaneously honoring that form and yet bringing it forward 2,000 years to talk about what is happening now in our streets. Um, or what Tania Saracho did with her adaptation of The Cherry Orchard to examine uh, legacy and what happens when, when you can no longer go, go home, right? When, when the land has been lost to you. Um, so I, I, I'd love to, uh, to talk about, you know, what are Latino artists doing when they're, when they're engaging with the classical Western canon, right? Um, what is driving this artistic impulse and 
how are we using these forms? What, what, to what end? To what purpose do you feel they're being used? Really good ones. Um, uh, you know, I, I Forces for good. Yeah, um, you know, really, uh, but I think that part of it is um, one of the hallmarks of the Latino theater tradition is what you know, academics sometimes call code switching. And I think it's, um, it's off, and also I think when you occupy a space, like I, I know it's not always what you think of when we as theater enthusiasts and theater make them together, theater is a conservative tradition. It's a tradition that really, uh, like most art making traditions are, have their bastions of conservatism, but theater as a practice is one rooted in, in repertoire. And it's rooted, like, where else do you say, like, well, we are going to do it as best, best. you know, it's like, and, and even this, this festival is sort of rooted with these callbacks to other historical moments. And so the question is, how do you, how do you name and claim a space for yourself within a tradition uh, that is so emphatically Euro Eurocentric, so emphatically uh, conservative? And I think that there's something very deft that happens with that kind of using that capacity to be, to speak in two voices or to speak in two languages simultaneously. Speak in two languages simultaneously so that they um, can communicate in a way that is bigger than either language on its own. And because I do think that that is the power of what Spanglish does, is it does something that draws upon the force of both. And I think when I look at Miranda or Alfaro or any of the other many other approaches to sort of taking a canonical repertoire based practice and you know it is uh, it, it is a way of claiming space but also claiming ownership but also naming something else and so I think there's something very sophisticated at work that I think every playwright is doing something a little bit different but I love that we're able to see this impulse and I think if we think of it in terms of thinking all the way back to Thespis and saying this is a way that Latino theater makers are, na are, are saying, I can have that conversation, I can have this conversation, I'm gonna have both conversations at the same time. Look at where we go when you listen. For me, I think it's a lot about like reclaiming, right? I do see sort of a difference in Hamilton to sort of the uh, Luis Alfaro's adaptation. So, um, we, you know, just having seen Mojada and, be, and living in LA and a lot of people, you know, raving about it, um, and telling me like I finally get the Greeks now it's an entry point right and it's true and people these are seasoned theater people who are like I really finally got it um, and then and then I had to revisit Medea for class and I just saw so much of what Luis masterfully did bubble up in the text and it was always there um, but then you know in my class we ended up talking about Syria right because we were talking about um, immigration and what it means to be a foreigner so to me it's an entry point and it's also a reclaiming like as theater people, okay, the Greeks are like our forefathers, right? But, it's, but there's always this pushback of like, but not really for Latinos or people of color, but it's to say these are our descendants too, theatrical descendants. And then I think what Lin-Manuel is doing, right? He reads this uh, book about Hamilton and in some interviews he's like, you know, I thought Hamilton was like kind of like a G, like he's sort of like a badass. And then he wants to layer that in with the sounds of where he grew up and the kind of music um, that he enjoys and so then it becomes also reclaiming an American history narrative like we're American we pledge allegiance to the flag and yet there are those who want to take that uh, connection away from us to say so this is my history as well being here so I think there's like similar impulses but done in, in different ways in terms of creating the text you know. and I think to to build on that uh, I think theater is a space of civic engagement it's our public town hall uh, it's a space where we engage in historical reclamation. Uh, we are, our theater makers are our creative historians and documentarians. If we're not, and it's correcting the record. Uh, I think of the uh, theater artists I follow who are writing about issues of violence and trauma. Somebody like Migdalia Cruz and her play El Grito del Bronx looking at a Puerto Rican um, prisoner on death row um, for being a ser serial killer and uh, a lot of people have criticized her work saying you know why are you writing about we need stronger Latino role models why are you putting us on stage that way and her response is well if you look at the daily news um, we're criminalized subjects uh, who are evil villains and perpetrators and we have no complexity to our histories and I think about um, the tradition of prison writing, we aren't, 
it's in theater where we're beginning to tell the stories of how incarceration is impacting our communities, a real scar of violence, but uh, also telling these stories so that our youth have a vocabulary to look at um, the school to prison pipeline and to be able to analyze how this is a form of cultural violence. And uh, if you look at the news, or uh, our, our stories are really left out of that, those critical gra grapplings, but it's in the spaces of the theater of civic engagement that we're really rewriting history. Um, engaging with history, showing that we're historically minded and that we're documentarians, but that we're also presenting counter histories and documenting our people and very much engaged in contemporary issues. So for me, theater is a civic space uh, and thinking about our histories, whether they're contemporary histories or um, deep histo uh, historical histories going back um, centuries, uh, theater is really important space and, and I think it's important uh, thinking about theater as a form of social change that it's a very democratic space. We can bring in all kinds of people into the theater. And, uh, so for me, that's why theater is so important, thinking about its relationship to history. Absolutely, so where, where theater becomes that, that battleground, right? where, where all these different ideologies and, and perspectives in our community come to, come to bear, which of course then is complicated when, when those stories are being enacted through Latino, Latina bodies, right? Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the early stages of, of thinking about you know, what, what I hope this panel would, would, um, would engage with, uh, I kept coming back to that phrase, uh, alma y corazón, you know, with, in, in, uh, in the struggle to, uh, to truly uh, humanely portray the heart and the soul of, of a people, of a community, of, of peoples who have come to this country through many different paths. Um, how do you begin to tell those stories when those stories have been told for us, right, and from very narrow perspectives? And so I'd, I'd love to, to ask about um, the unique challenges that, uh, that are posed when, uh, we, when we are taking on Latino, Latina performance aesthetics and when those intersect with questions of casting like casting, resources, uh, training as, as we receive it through conservatory programs or academic programs uh, or even institutions. Um, and, to, and to ask, what is, what is the burden for artistic representation for Latino performers, theater makers, uh, creators? Uh, and what are the questions that we're not really engaging with yet? Well. I, I feel very strongly that one of the areas of cultural expertise that I think exists in uh, the Latino theater making community that hasn't really been appreciated or understood is how um, Latino theater artists have become really using their, ha, most Mexican actors have been asked to play a Puerto Rican role, vice versa. You know, this, this experience of cross-cultural identification within the category of Latino is something that happens pretty routinely. And there's something that opens up for, I think, I don't know very many other places among Latino cultural workers where that kind of deep in, embodied, cons, like sort of what it feels like to be in a culture that is both alike and dissimilar to yours and that having that sense of stakes of I want to do it right, you know, this kind of sense of responsibility of how to, of how to do that kind of migration and drawing upon one's skills, especially as an actor, to sort of say like, okay, I'm used to playing people who are not me. This person is simultaneously not me, not from my culture, but I can also see this, feel this sense of burden and expectation. And what it comes up is there's very often that work is expected to be done um, in the actor's spare time in their own, like, and so I think when we deal with students, you know, uh, Mexican-American actors being play, cast to play a Puerto Rican character might not be offered the vocal training necessary to understand the, the um, technique involved and how technique is a, is a tool that the actor can use in bridging that sense of cultural dis distance with integrity and with responsibility. Our educational institutions and conventionally, there's not a degree of cultural competence on the part of decision makers to, there's often the sense of, oh, well, she's Latina, that we're done. You know, we've, we've cast a Latina in the role, we're done. And so there's not a sense of cultural competence on their part to even hear the di differences, staging productions, and not hearing the I idiomatic inflections that a family doesn't sound like they're from the same country, let alone the same house. Mm -hmm. um, these kinds of gaps and how, what, how technique and craft Mm -hmm. are in some ways those ways to solve these issues. And there are champions, 
in our midst who do this work in a yeoman's way and often find their calling as directors, as dramaturgs, as actors, as voice teachers through this challenge. And yet they are, there's still a, a lack of conversation. Like almost any actor coming out of any serious training program will be able to do any number of regional dialects in the UK. You know, and yet taking a tutorial in terms of idiosyncratic, idiomatic distinctions of Latino, act, Latino dialects within Texas is incomprehensible, let alone the United States. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, there is a, a meaningful gap that expertise has been cultivated by organic intellectuals on theater stages around the country, and yet we haven't found a way even in hospitable institutions to value that as a resource that needs to be invested in and that every actor needs to be able to have their ears so they can hear the difference, not mm -hmm. just Latino actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that crosses over to like the you know soundscape of a play, right? You're in a Mexican household and then suddenly there's like salsa playing. It's usually probably the other way around. You're in like a Puerto Rican household and then you hear like banda music or something. And people who are culturally aware, you're like, it takes you out of the play. It's a distraction uh, and it frustrates me. And we see the same, you know, we had a big conversation yesterday about this dialect question because it's not only theater but we see it in film and TV and I just think it's lazy right it's sort of it's really frustrating because we're not we're not given the value just to do a little research like you know what I mean and then yeah that the burden is on the actor or maybe the stage manager who happens to be Latino or something and it's like oh yeah can you just tell us from your wellspring of knowledge of every Latino culture and that's <laughs> really unfair right because then ultimately we are we not only represent our own you know personal Latino background but all Latinos everywhere, and that's just a burden of responsibility that I think a lot of people of color share. And I think about um, the happiest song plays last, and, and looking at the female uh, lead who you know is like quarter Egyptian, and, and her struggling with that identity. A lot of people, you know, may may not even speak Spanish, and then they're asked to train their their fellow actor how to speak, you know. And and so that's a it creates tension in the room, um, and also a feeling of like um, that it's not worth the investment of time. One of the stories that inspired me to uh, build a Latino theater ensemble for my students, but to build it not on campus in the community, was we uh, did Josefina Lopez's Detained in the Desert on campus, and it was the first Latino play that anybody could um, remember being done at my university, which is a Hispanic-serving institution. It was the first Latino play anybody could remember having been done in decades. Nobody could even tell me what the Latino play that had been done before it was. And a, a Chicana student was cast in um, the role of Sandy, who's a Chicana kind of discovering her own sense of what it means to be a Chicana and thinking about immigration issues. And the Chicana actor uh, playing her part had um, uh, started to really break down during rehearsal. And the director said, you know, what's going on? Is it thinking about what this character is doing in, the, uh, in a detainment uh, situation. And she said, no, you know, I studied acting all through high school. I got to play in Shakespeare. I've played male characters. I've done all kinds of things as an actor, except play someone who looks like me, and I don't know how to do it. And here I am as a Chicana actor. I don't even know how to find my sense of voice within a play that I've been hungry and waiting to be in all my life. So, um, you know, in the ensemble that I've created, the Segundo Hueves Latino Play Project Ensemble in the community, we do, uh, last year it was a monthly stage reading and I realized that was, uh, I, the only way that that worked is we had the wonderful producer, Stephanie Castro, uh, who's now here at OSF. <laughs> running our project and this year we have Melly, Melanie Capons who's here with us this weekend um, but we're doing it as a quarterly project last year it was a monthly project it immediately became a standing room only event in the community people bringing youth in to see the plays it was free and open to the public but it was really um, exciting for the Latino students because they got to be in connection with their culture engage their storytelling tradition but they also got to engage these very difficult and, and potent questions about aesthetics and training and voice and identity and engage in the craft of art making and have questions 
put at them through this art that was meaningful to them and how they were sharing it with their community in a way that doesn't happen in these other situations where, oh, I have a Latino student, they're cast in a Latino role, that's end of story, I don't need to do uh, stretch work with them around craft and, uh, and history and aesthetics. So that, that was a big motivating factor for why I wanted to create a theater ensemble for Latino students on my co college campus. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other things, just to say that um, we, we talk about these things and what, why we need to do them, and sometimes people feel it's insular, like, oh, that's just for Latino theater as a style or genre. But, you know, there was recently an article that now there's going to be a multicultural or multi, you know, generational casting of 1776, the musical, right, with a completely diverse cast. And you see that influence of Hamilton, right? And, and not only that, like, okay, it's, it's being looked at artistically as brilliant, it's selling tickets, you know what I mean? And so then there is that, we talked about sort of this commodification and how do we play with that, but that, but that Latino artistic choices really can propel the field in certain ways and that we have to value our input as in the new American theater, like Luis Valdez says, right? That, there, mm -hmm. that we do have an artistic value that can really push things forward mm -hmm. um, in ways that it's just us doing the work we want to do, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. In our, in our conversation yesterday, there were, there were a couple of, uh, of, of, um, of phrases that came up, it was like they talk, talking about like the idea of craft, right, and the idea of, um, of, of how we engage with representation about the assumption that as soon as you put a, a brown body on stage, they are automatically authentic. And, uh, and that we have the obligation to be native informants, right? Which I thought, like, like for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry those two things with me and like they are now on my radar, so I love that. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we make time and space for your questions, because I'm sure by this point, you are all bubbling. I can feel you in the room and think, oh my gosh, all right, so I'm gonna do an Oprah, and okay, so the three of you stay up here, I'm gonna walk. Do we, do we all get a free TV, Lydia? Oh my God. You get a car and you get a car. Check under your seat. One of you want a car. Christopher, that's okay, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, anybody have a burning question you want to launch us off with? Yes. Tony. I have too many questions. Because uh, I've lived it. You know, I've lived the whole gamut of everything you're talking about, from the theater to television to film. Um, and, and, and I may be ignorant because I'm kind of living in TV land, and, and now I live in New York, so let me, let me just get to the point, first of all, I, I think it's an important question. It's what I see and what I experience in terms of a disconnect between theater artists and theater audiences, mm -hmm. okay? And then we're talking about, and this is an example, because, you know, today at Delano, we had, we had some a Latin presence, but it was not the dominant presence. So what's happening is that a lot of our artists are produced in regional uh, theaters and, and urban theaters throughout the country, um, but very few Latinos see it, experience it. Anglos or whatever, or predominantly Anglo, or non, I would say non-ethnic, because you know, Anglo is like, I don't know what that means. But anyway, um, uh, and here's the deal. I was, as you know, in uh, Happiest Song Plays Last. Um, and they had a ton of money, second stage, to outreach to the Latino community. Um, they spent a lot of money on ads. Nobody came, no Latinos came, very few. They had a couple of buses from Philly, okay, who came, it was the best performance, it was a party. They were singing with us, dancing in the aisles, talking back to us. I, we went, wow. And then a lot of times we would close that play at the end of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, the last scene and we, would, we wouldn't even get applause. You had Anglos staring at us like, what just happened? Like they were looking at a car accident. Uh, so what I'm saying, and then I think the same conundrum exists sometimes in terms of theater artists who live in kind of a solipsism, you know, of their own, you know, artistic ghetto bubble, okay? Whatever you want to call it, barrio bubble. And, and, and they, are, they are performing for a very small audience of Latinos or maybe some, some, some Anglos who come in. In, 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 in LA, I, I see a lot of Jews, <laughs> you know, sometimes. So how do, we deal, how do we get out of that? You know, how do we make what, what our artists are doing mainstream and still attract the Latino community? Because, because what happened in, in, at second stage, and I, I'm sorry for taking so long with the question, but what happened at second stage is that the price point 
was too high. 85 bucks for a Latino. And let me tell you, there's a lot of middle class lawyers and stuff like that. And still, you multiply it by we come in groups where you come in packs. So it, it was like, you know, 85 times four times six, it's a shitload of money. Okay? And so we that nobody came. And, and, and it was Kiara Hudes, Pulitzer Prize, the end of a trilogy. I mean, a significantly historical event. And nobody came, except a lot of Anglos who didn't quite connect with the play, as far as I could tell. You know, they weren't involved in the themes, or, or um, certainly the, you know, the intellectuals were, the artists, the people who came, who were part of the artistic community. But a lot of times I feel that we are performing theater for our own artistic community only. And that we're living again in this solipsism of, of, of artistry. So I just want to have you could talk to that. Well, I think that that's an enduring question, and I do, and I do think that the question is is something. If we if I could answer this question today, a lot of people would be very happy to because they're paying a lot of consultants to answer this question, a lot of money, um, <laughs> you know. And if I could if I could answer it for free, I would um, because. But I don't know that there is a. I, d I think probably there's two things that, I, that come to mind for me. One is um, theater in this country generally uh, treat, does not invite people to, its, to, its, to participate. It expects people to participate. It says, we're doing this important thing. You should come. Rather than creating an incentive of this is why, this is why it's meaningful. And I think uh, depending on the market, depending on like the, the price point is maneuverable. Latinos spend a lot of money on entertainment. All the studies say every three years there's a big study about how much Latino audiences spend on entertainment. Latino, yeah, no, no, but the thing is, is but, but, but they're spending in terms of chunk something that could go to it, that would get them a really good theater experience. But the thing is, is the practice of welcome of like, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible investment of time and logistics and sort of like for something you're not sure you're gonna like. You know, and so I think like techniques that Luis Alfaro talks about a lot of making sure that there's sort of a conversation with the outreach, a conversation with marketing, conversation with ticketing, so that there's a sense to bridge those gaps. Two Rivers in, in Red Bank is trying all sorts of different ways to try to bridge the gaps. And I think that what is essential is to really listen for when we are, think we're offering an invitation, but it's actually an expectation. You know, and to really ask when our marketing materials go out to say, is this just saying, this is valuable, come worship at the altar of art? Right. <laughs> um, and if that's what it's saying, whatever idiom it's using, whatever graphics it's using, whatever, I mean, because I think that that's the mainstream stuff is, is you spend the money because you know you're gonna have an experience that's worth having. And I think in theater, it's a risk. You don't know if you're gonna like the play. And you often have to go to a neighborhood you don't know. You often have to park in a way that's very confusing. There's a lot of obstacles. <laughs> There's a lot of obstacles. And I think that, that, that generally the American theater um, sees those as the problem of the audience member, not the problem of the theater institution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so I think that this is a tricky thing and I think there's all kinds of really creative leadership because I don't think this is just a Latino problem but I think the Latino problem opens it up in very particular ways. I don't know how many of you saw on your feed in Chicago when it tried out this summer which is the Gloria Estefan, Emilio Estefan musical that's headed to Broadway. I have not been in an expensive theater with as many Latinos in that house. And, it's, and so I think what we've got this moment in the, commercial, in the most expensive part of theater making in the world, Broadway, We've got two musicals that are hitting with Latino authors. You know, very different approaches, both doing very, con very conventional American stories. And it'll be interesting, I think we've already know that like, there's not gonna be a lot of Latinos in Hamilton, mm -hmm. w uh, watching Hamilton, because the tickets are so expensive, they've already sold out, there's all these things. They're, the question of what impact the recording is gonna have, I think is open. But I, I will be interested to see if they can transfer the success that they had in reaching Latino consumers, not necessarily established theater audiences, but Latino. They seem to have a pretty remarkable success in Chicago. It was surprising to me. And, and I checked around with other folks, and it was, seemed like it was not a fluke. It was still not the majority of the audience, but it was a substantial subset of the audience. And I think that's what we need to aim for. But it's, again, going back to these bigger, it's a bigger question, but for us, I think, because we come out of community-engaged and community-based traditions, it feels even, the distance is so stark. Yeah, as a producer, you know, part of that for me, I think the accessibility question for me is about accessibility 
across class, you know, looking at class, across mm -hmm. uh, ethnicity, cultural background, right, that, and also age, like, so we try to make tickets accessible so people who are young, you know, college students paying for things on their own, but, but if you're in a certain class bracket, that you can still access high quality theater. Um, in terms of the relationship of Latino audiences, it's a long end game relationship building process. And I see sort of the work that's happening at Center Theater Group, at the shop, you know, that um, people are, are going out into the community, spending their Saturday mornings there, working hands-on with a group of people, involving them in a, in a production long term. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a history of mistrust in terms of major theaters being like doing the sort of poaching, right? There, there's this concept of culture poaching where we have the one show, you know, in Hispanic Heritage Month, and we need you to come um, because we have a grant for it, and then we're going to have our, our education, you know, department do something around. It's just sort of this thing, and we have to break from that. And I think uh, communities uh, are feeling tired of that. And then it's and it's new strategies of long-term uh, engagement and getting people young to the theater. If you don't have a tr practice of going to the theater, it's hard to start that. You know, when you have a full-time job and three kids. You know. And we've been talking a lot about um, reading Latino theater as the new American theater. We want our theater tradition to be read uh, on, on two registers, one for its cultural specificity and its history and its aesthetic and its, it, its tradition that way, but it's also part of the American theater. I think the work being done here uh, at OSF to really cultivate work, reading this work as part of the new American theater, work that's been done you know, by uh, so many of the artists in this room, you know, Luis Alfaro, Diane Rodriguez, Juliet Carrillo, Jose Cruz Gonzalez. I mean, there, there's so many people in this room who've spent decades forging a space for our artists to really be empowered and have their work on uh, American theater stages. And now I think that that's happened, the project is really thinking about new American theater audiences. Really, how do we uh, uh, cultivate the next generation and have our youth be as excited uh, to go to the theater as they are to go to a concert and a film? Um, and uh, how do we also educate audiences to be uh, excited and hungry and feel that Latino theater is part of the American theater. To me, um, the reading at Delano this morning was incredibly excited. We were sitting at lunch today and um, a, a non-Latino patrons at a table behind us, they kept leaning over and at first we thought it was because we were being very, oh, loud, we were very and, loud and animated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they leaned over and said, we just want to tell you how much much we loved, they actually said your play, uh, <laughs> acknowledging it. We were like, it's not our play. But they were acknowledging we can unpack that, that later. <laughs> that uh, it, it belonged, they were they were acknowledging Luis Alfaro's play was, you know, part of our group, that we were ambassadors for that work, and they wanted to take the time to tell us how much they loved the work um, and how excited they were by it. And you could feel that in the room. So for me, that's the ideal moment is you're putting people in a room where we can come and have a conversation like this, but you're also putting people in a room so that we can just be really excited about seeing incredible work together. Um, so I, I, yes, I agree. We all have these stories that we're grappling with, mm -hmm. but this is an incredibly exciting moment for us to become really cognizant about not only our place in the American theater, but how we're building the new American theater audiences. And it is, it is definitely, uh, I think, the, the way that we have to uh, work against the one and done approach, that we tried that once and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It really needs to be part of a long-term organizational strategy uh, in terms of saying like, okay, we're doing this show this year, we're doing this show next year, we're gonna try these things, we're gonna move forward, we're gonna grow as an institution because this is, a, this is an institutional commitment to imagining our audience. So on the one hand, more Latinos come. On the other hand, our core established audience isn't so gobsmacked they don't know to applaud. Like, how, what, are these, what are these distances that this experience revealed in our organization, and how can we take a forward move through that? That is, that is ideally, I think, the, the takeaway from mm -hmm. moments like that. Unfortunately, uh, the last 30 years has shown us in universities and not-for-profits and commercial theaters, oh, it didn't work, so we're not going to do it for another 10 years. 
Right. You know, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, no, no. I mean, I think it's, it's at every tier. It's at every tier. And I think that the, the contrary leadership is to say, well, yes, it didn't work, but there are lessons to be learned. What happens if we try this again next year? That will develop more talent pool. That will develop, we can build on the connections we did build this year. Like this, mm -hmm. it's, it's a slight orientation, but it really does resist against that. We gave it a shot. It bon like it didn't work the way we wanted to. So no, we're not doing that again. It was too much work. It, did pay, it didn't pay off. And that is really going against at all levels, whether you're making money or making a lot of money or making no money at all, there still is that idea of was that worth the investment of time and energy? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and I think it is about what you were saying, the long game. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, we, we are talking about the, the, the future of, of uh, our practice, not just you know, what we're doing this season. Right, in fact, I've got the next question over here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, sorry, my throat's kind of sore and I'm a bit nervous, so forgive me. Um, to preface this, I had a very hard time deciding where I needed to be today, and I emphasize where I needed to be because I have this feeling this week, I don't know why, that maybe each one of us has a role in life and something to contribute. And I was torn between a March for the Mentally Ill sponsored by NAMI today and being here in a Latino Play Project discussion. I thought, well, in the scheme of things, gee, we're talking about legislation that could affect millions in this country versus eh, theater, eh, eh. I happened to be in Ashland. It was a quarter two. I already had a ticket. Okay, time management. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> and I think I needed to be here because... Yes, I'm not going to go into it, but I have a lot of reason to be at that march, especially today. But in the scheme of things, I think my voice may be louder here than it would be there. I say that as a Latina theater practitioner. I don't, I, I use that term specific. Spanglish is my mother tongue. Can I speak in Spanglish? Claro. ¿Me van a entender todo el mundo aquí? Espero que sí. En inglés tatamudeo, lo siento mucho. Este, I uh, am an actor. I went to CalArts. In fact, I have a fellow alum here. I would have liked to have said I finished, but unfortunately for health reasons, I was unable to. For health reasons, I ended up in Ashland. Uh, I know several of people at OSF here. For health reasons, I unfortunately have not been able to as put as far a foot forward as I'd like to, I hope that will change. I also thought, here I am, not to denigrate, in this bloody 20,000 20, population city, entre comillas, cuando yo estoy acostumbrada a millares en la, la capital federal de México, en Nueva York, en Cairo, en Londres y Washington DC. So in the scheme of things, being a working theater practitioner, I thought, what the? am I doing here? That was a bleep. Sorry about that. We don't have bleep. So anyway, under this umbrella, I am an actor, a writer, a dramaturg, etc., etc. I would like to know what happens as far as casting when you're not brown enough or you're too white. Where do you fall in the scheme of things when you're a Jewish, American, Bolivian, Anglophile? Where do I fit in as far as casting is concerned? Where do I fit in as far as wanting to write plays that will be, as you were saying, Tiffany, is that your name? No quiero meter la pata y mi memoria es, for an actor is really bleep. <laughs> so w what do you do if you want to address these things? You want to use theater as, as social change because damn it, it, at the same time, it is a forum for social change, but it's so bleep elitist. Mm -hmm. What the fuck do you do? I just, I don't mean just in terms of audience members, I'm talking about the themes. Well, I, I really appreciate your comments, uh, especially um, just given my own investment in thinking about theater for social change and thinking about, I think about theater as where we stage conversations that otherwise may not be taking place. Um, some work, and I think there's many kinds of theaters. I think we have to, um, you know, we think about the most visible theaters, right? These incredible spaces of visibility and resources, but there's all kinds of um, theaters. And I think when you tap into really what's happening in the larger national and local community of 
Latino theater here in the U.S. It's such an incredible spectrum. One group, and uh, you know, uh, I'd be happy to send you a PDF copy of the play. But there's a play uh, by uh, Latina Breath and Fire, uh, Breath of Fire Latina Theater Ensemble out of Southern California, Orange County, and they have a play called Slip of the Tongue, which is a trilogy looking at mental, spiritual, and physical health issues. The first play is about surviving date rape. The second the second play is about uh, a young child um, battling, uh, realizing her father is an addict and how that happens in the family. And the third is about bipolar condition and really how do we uh, address and deal with bipol po bipolar mental health issues in our community. So playwrights are writing about all kinds of things and uh, I think that's why forums like this are really Im important because we get to have a sharing about the work that's out there, the different kinds of theater makers there are that, that are out there, but we also within our community have to be careful of just seeing one kind of visible um, writer, one kind of visible theater, um, and, and engage in uh, finding uh, spaces where we can do our cultural homework. Like I'm looking at my colleague Alma Rosa Alvarez, who teaches here locally, and what an incredible resource she is, thinking about the history of Latino literature and the role of theater within that. We, we we have um, key people out there that can help us uh, uh, expand our, our knowledge and our conversations and our resources. We were talking about how historically, this is a very important moment in that it's really been within the last five years that scholars have been part of these convenings and national conversations with theater artists because we realize that we need to do this knowledge sharing. Um, so I, I appreciate, um, the questions that you're putting out there, and I don't know if I have any one answer other than to say, you know, there's all kinds of resources, and hoping, hopefully this is an opening up to uh, take you on the journey of yeah. grappling with the questions that you shared with us. Right. Right. And I. The best discussion is one that doesn't provide answers, it provides questions. Right. No, I, I would just want to add to you um, that I think ensemble, like joining an ensemble or finding, creating an ensemble in which then you can play all sorts of roles, I think is crucial. Devised theater is a great forum to play. Um, I'm thinking about the work of Alex Meda and Teatro Luna, um, but this also brings up this issue of sort of criticism, right? How you're read, how your body is read. And I bring up this show because there was uh, a really sort of sexist um, um, and racist a review, I wouldn't even call it a real review of the show, but which, uh, you know, the company is a pan-Latina company. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the cast was made up of Afro-Latinas and Latinas who pass as white, like I do, you know, that, that don't read as brown. And the reviewer had the gall to say, well, this is a Latina company, but I spotted two black actors and three white actors. And that, that mm -hmm. is something that, right, way to go, sir, right? So that was, but that created a space Face of like, it was devastating for us to think like a, a critic thinks that, that that's that's what they're reading, and so I you know those are those moments that it, you're not alone, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that that we have to move forward and create art that responds to this, and also develop critics and and scholars and practitioners, people who can speak about this work intelligently. You know? Absolutely, absolutely, great. I think I have the next question already set up. Um, in reference to um, the, the article in the UCB that came out that the Upright Citizens Brigade has an issue with a lack of diversity, um, I want to speak to comedy. One of the things that I know from the Denver Regional Theaters is that well, they make a good commitment to bringing Latino shows, but very rarely is it they're like deep, heady, emotional pieces, and that's one of the things you see in Latino community theater. What are some of the things that we can draw on in terms of comedy? Because I think that there's an immediacy about comedy and a cultural um, capital that comedy has right now that I think that we could use to get younger actors in and to speak to a broader audience. And, and of the, the 10 biggest earning comedians globally, three are Latino. <laughs> and this is talking like big money. Um, so I do think that that is, the, I think that there are those kind of questions of what are the pleasures of theater going? And the pleasures of theater going is laughing. The pleasures of theater going is, ha is coming together with your family. You know, the pleasures of theater going is having a sense, I always say that like, it's, um, like if we could figure out how to 
build relationships with theaters the way teams have them, where like you can have a bad season and they'll still come back the next year. You know, it's just like, if we could just figure that out, you know, it would be like, how do we build that sense of community identity, that sense of commitment, the sense of like, oh, I don't like, I didn't like those 10 years that he was leading it, but I was there every time. You know, like that sense of identification is I think something that Latinos really connect, like there's a loyalty, there's a commitment, there's a passion, there's a, and, and I think his audience, but I do think the question of pleasure and comedy and the, the awareness of what are the different registers of entertainment, and this I think goes in some ways to the sort of the prize winning, the sort of what are the tastes of the sort of the mainstream, the, the sort of the general literary establishment, what are they looking for, and the way that theater makers are, especially playwrights, um, here thinking primarily about playwrights, they're negotiating a lot of different constituencies. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that that is, there's a playwright, Liz Coronado Castillo, um, at uh, presented a play called I Know at uh, Teatro Vivo, Vivo in Austin last year that I happened to see and it was really an extraordinary and crowd pleasing and crowd affirming work. And I happened to recommend it to a small company in Albuquerque and uh, Camino Real produced it and they had their biggest season ever. And it was like they had people that had never walked into the National Hispanic Cultural Center who lived in Albuquerque. They had never been in that building. You know? And so, so I think there are ways, and this is I think the, the other thing too, is independent producers, what, is, what are the different, different ways of producing? Institutional production is one way of making theater. Educational is another community based, but also independent producing. So I do think that there, it's worth us being, having our ears open. I think one of the things for me as a scholar of popular performance is I want to talk about what's going on on Broadway at the same time as I want to talk about what's going on in the storefront down the street and what's going on in the community based ensemble. This is, and I think our sometimes we get really niche in not thinking across these divisions. And yet I think that there are points where the crossover actors move between those divisions. You know, so, so, so how can we learn from what the actors have learned from that wisdom? But we've got to sort of listen to the ways, because Latino audiences, and this is what all the, everybody always wants to know, we want to get the Latino audience. <laughs> we want to get them to buy tickets to our thing. Um, they are buying lots of tickets. They're not always buying Latino tickets to Latino content. And so what is the pleasure that is drawing them to spend their hard-earned money with their families to go in these experiences. And I think that's where the lesson of comedy is really important. But again, it's a matter of like, where is, where is a culturally diverse improv? Like there are a couple in New York that I know that are really approaching sort of, we are gonna be, not, they're not saying this, but they, we, they wanna be like the Hamilton of, of improv comedy. They wanna be the one that like everything's in there and everything's up for grabs and, not, and resist the segregation within that genre. But I do think that the, those questions are key and the pleasures of theater going need to be our biggest carrot. You know, like it's fun to come. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I, I, I knew we were not going to have enough time for everything that we wanted to talk about. You know, we only have an hour and 15 minutes. But first of all, you know, I, I want to thank all of you for gathering here with us today. All of you out in the Latino sphere uh, joining us, watching this conversation. I hope you're madly tweeting and Facebooking about uh, what you've been hearing about today. Uh, the conversation is by no means over, although some of us will be heading to the bar, I'm sure. Um, but I do want to... Okay, Brian's gonna say one more thing. One thing we promised to say yesterday was this practice of having conversations oh, yeah. is something that the Latino Theater Commons has modeled of building the space for, for um, the perspectives brought by scholars, bringing us in spaces with, uh, with audiences and art makers. And this is something that if your organization is not doing this, ask them to. You know, ask them to stage events like Absolutely. this. Academics are remarkably cheap dates. So, um, so it's not hard to do this. And the network of the Latino Theater Commons has activated this network and put us in conversation. This is a space of collaboration and the, and the presence of scholars and advocates is a really important thing that the Latino Theater Commons has modeled. And I really encourage you, whatever your concerns are within your, the theater companies that is your team, make sure that they're building these spaces for these conversations. It's a practice we've fallen away from, and it's something that can model uh, artistic citizenship moving forward in ways that I think is transformative. So. Absolutely, absolutely. So please join me in thanking los meros, meros profesores. Dr. Brian Herrera, Dr. Chantal Rodriguez, Dr. Tiffany Ana Lopez.
And thank you all for being here. Enjoy the weekend.